now it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage Alex Marchesov. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much all for coming to this session. I'm Alex Matrosov, and it's been a very interesting research which has been done by Binary Team and Yegor Vasilenko, Alex Yermolov, and Sam Tamas make a great contribution to this research. And first of all, I wanted to say it's a big difference from the previous year. I've been presenting the last year in Vegas for Black Hat, and I see a couple of more people coming actually to the session. It's great to see you guys uh, here in Vegas. All right, this is a binary team, and uh, kudos go to the whole team for hard work on this research, and we have a lot of stuff to discuss today. So, first of all, like uh, pre-EFI uh, vulnerabilities, it's been constantly overlooked, and actually it connects the whole uh, interesting and uh, uh, very uh, dangerous and impactful uh, space for the researchers and the attackers as well. And uh, some of them actually bypassing uh, a lot of mitigation just by design, and like uh, STM, PPM, and other fancy mitigations which is Intel developed. Unfortunately, it can be bypassed from the pre E5 phases, early boot phases. But let's actually talk about uh, how this research started and some pre-story. So in 2017, we've already been talking about Intel Boot Guard and uh, how actually modifying some of the data which is controlled the boot process, it's actually reflect on the bypass the whole security features, right? And uh, in 2019, with Alexandra Gazette, we've been talking about how security boundaries are important to consider as a threat model because different security boundaries, when they are crossing, have a different impact on some of the mitigations or security features. And uh, we've done that before. And of course, the last year, uh, when we first time uh, with Alex Tereshkin and Adam Zabrowski kind of like a go deep dive with uh, some of the vulnerabilities in pre-E5 phase, and of course like uh, Intel BSSA, DFT, it's been kind of like a, an eye opening for pre-E5 phases for the exploitation. And uh, by the way, this one is nominated for most underhyped Pony Awards. We'll see, maybe we can get this one for this uh, sweet vulnerability. And unfortunately, actually, it's still uh, available in the wild, unpatched on many systems. Make sure you are not the one. And um, on Offensive Con in February, we actually dropped about 22 new fresh baked CVs uh, related mostly for system management mode. And uh, we can see literally like it is a repeatable failure is happening in the industry with such vulnerabilities. And uh, the space with uh, vulnerability research in the firmware has been overlooked. And system management mode memory corruption, to be honest, it's not a new vector. It is actually like known from the early 2000s, but still, uh, it is available, and of course, when you write your firmware on the C language, it creates some interesting rooms for uh, memory corruption. All right, uh, what is a PPAM? And actually, in our offensive research talk, we say we are looking on PPAM, and actually, it's Platform Properties Assessment Module, which is responsible for armoring system management mode. It's one of the more uh, powerful uh, modes on the x86 systems and uh, basically, like uh, we say, we will be find some bypasses for sure because the complexity of such feature is actually incredible, and uh, we did. All right, but before we dig into pre five phases uh, with the PI drivers, let's talk about ACM. And Intel ACM, it is a authenticated code modules. Think about it as just a binary blob, which is executed uh, separately from your firmware. And uh, actually, it is loading to um, cache directly on CPU. This cache is locked. It's co called like a cache as RAM on the CPU feature. And uh, it's providing some additional capabilities for attestation or basically for TXT and a lot of other things. But what's interesting uh, about the ACM, their complexity is also growing. And basically, we already showed it before uh, with binary research team uh, Intel Boot Guard, Intel BIOS Guard bypasses, and actually vulnerabilities in Intel TXT, it's not rare. And uh, uh, 
Also, as example, the changes in USAMs, uh, first of all, it's increased the security over like the hashes, new hash functions used and uh, RSAs, but it's not about that. The size of the module, it actually grows like uh, more than five times, right? It's been a 32 kilobytes, now it's 256 kilobytes, right? What happening when the code base is growing? Attack surface is growing as well. And um, uh, ACM are responsible also for uh, attestation of PPAM policies. And uh, this is very important to remember because we, very, we have a very interesting discovery later on uh, uh, in our presentation. And uh, um, also, as example, uh, talking from the attack surface perspective, Intel patched like uh, about 10 vulnerabilities in ACMs for this year. And uh, that means this attack surface is actually pretty legit. All right, let's dive to pre fire attack surface. And uh, just a reminder about what the attacker model and potential impact. I don't want to go uh, that deep, but basically all these vulnerabilities we're talking today, it can be used for the persistent implant delivery and bypassing all the security boundaries on uh, firmware space. Also, vulnerabilities which is related to NVRAM, it's actually not protected uh, if we're talking about the persistent storage on the spy flash, it's usually not protected by boot guard. Interestingly, if you have NVRAM payload, basically it can be a constant re-exploitation during the boot and actually can gain for the attacker the persistence. It's why I would say this vulnerability is very dangerous because technically uh, from just SMM you can be protected, but from NVRAM persistent storage sometimes it's not considered by system architects or device vendors as potential space for the persistence, but it is. So, and um, you can see uh, actual complexity of communicating constantly during the boot process with NVRAM storage, right? But let's talk more about the pre fi attack vectors. And we have so many of them, to be honest. So basically, it's why is the pre fi so dangerous? As you can see on this picture, it started earlier than actually Dixie phase and SMM get initialized. Um, also, during the pre fi boot phases, it is actually called like a uh, platform initialization phase, right? It's a lot of security features get initialized. It's a lot of things happening like a memory training and other things, but also pre fi space is actually sometimes accessible for the code execution uh, from the operating system. But of course, it gives more limited capabilities uh, for the attacker compared to during when the early boot just started because a lot of memory regions are already locked, but still it can be used for bypassing a lot of security features. So, and um, as example, uh, during um, PI phase, we can of course bypass all the security protection on SPY because it's just not enabled and it's just not happened yet before. So all the historical mitigations like a BIOS lock enable and uh, SMM BIOS write protections, it can be bypassed because it's basically a uh, natural uh, design uh, of the firmware for UEFI standard. And basically, I wanted to say uh, sometimes it's very important from the perspective of the specification or the standard, if it is exist from early 2000s, to review and reconsider how different boot phases can actually reflect on new security features, right? And of course, like a complexity, it's always enemy of security, and you can see that about how many vulnerabilities we managed to find. So basically, um, this slide is a summary of the 12 CVEs, which is disclosed right now, and all the advisories are uploaded on binary website, so you can go and uh, learn more details about them, and some of the POCs also available public. And uh, interesting uh, reminder also about some of the issues which is related to independent BIOS developers, it's actually uh, not only connected to single device vendor, it impacts the whole ecosystem which actually use a similar code across the different devices and product lines. 
But also on this slide, I wanted to thank you, all the PCR teams and their hard work to helping us get in time disclosed all these vulnerabilities. Let's talk about the exploitation. And uh, actually, S3 Resume to PI, it's very interesting vulnerability because it actually shows the supply chain problem as well. First of all, this code is actually exists on EDK2, but unfortunately, it's got modified with uh, some of the code by uh, independent BIOS developer, and uh, basically what happened with this modification, it's actually introduced vulnerability. And of course, this vulnerability will be exist on many other systems which is use this code from independent BIOS developer, which is actually connected to this vulnerability. And um, problem is also when someone is forking uh, public reference code, it is actually support this fork, keep it up to date, and a lot of other things uh, come into supply chain security. I think actually it's better to keep consistent uh, this code and actually the same as original uh, reference code because it basically will be give much easier and transparent uh, supply chain from that perspective. What the vulnerability is? So basically we have uh, a get variable value, FPDT variable, which is actually contain uh, ST performance table pointer, and we can uh, get uh, access to ACPI ST performance address actually from the operating system memory, and we can change this ST performance table pointer, and basically it will be cause arbitrary write to controllable address. Interesting thing about this vulnerability, we don't have an access to NVRAM variable itself because it's not accessible in runtime, but we have an access to the pointer in memory. And basically, uh, it's been very interesting discussions with the developers because they say, oh, how you can exploit it? It is uh, not available in runtime, but we control the pointer. No, no, it's not possible. But actually, after developing the POC on that, uh, it's been more convincible. So, yeah, let's take a look on the demo. So, basically, we have, uh, yep. as you can see on this demo, basically it works very fast. What we need to do, we need to modify the pointer and actually trigger S3 sleep mode, and then it actually goes to the sleep mode, and boom, we have the code execution. And this uh, arbitrary write, it actually give you just a bit more than uh, two bytes of controllable value. What we can do with the two bytes? And we can see more about that because two bytes sometimes can bypass all the mitigations, but it's just one vulnerability we're discussing today. Uh, another one, it's a platform we need advanced premium, which is also pretty interesting because actually it can bypass all authenticated variables from the system management mode which is protected, right? So, but basically, if you have this code execution in system management mode, basically, all the variables are read-only uh, if they are authenticated. And basically, if you gain the privileges to system management mode, you can do that. So, also, with such variables, it is a physical attack vector always available when you can just reprogram and these variables in persistent storage, you can basically uh, make, gain the persistent over constant code execution, which I mentioned before. Again, demo time, most recent NAC, Tiger Lake, released in this year, so boom. Yep. But we have 12 of them. We will go in, in the more details and more details on that. So this vulnerability, SMM uh, <laughs> BIOS ELOG, this is actually also very interesting because this exactly functionality uh, being developed for providing additional telemetry and exchange the information from uh, SMM to provide actually some debug data, bring up data, or whatever has been considered for developing for. So, but, Sometimes it's my handlers, which is actually just for reminder, it's callback functions from the firmware to operating system layer to hook some of the functionality from, uh, from the firmware to operating system. And uh, 
these callback functions sometimes have a very complex uh, inherited pointers. So, and as we can see here with uh, this case, when basically we can have like a API func one and many others, but this function API func one, as you can see on the slide, is actually uh, can be triggered some additional functionality over overflow when the attacker can actually just cause the classical memory corruption. As we can see, it's lead to the copy mem and with a controllable buffer and size, it's actually given an attacker opportunity to exploit it. The link to POC is there. But basically, reference code issues, it's, uh, it's, it's happening and basically uh, another reminder about um, pretty similar vulnerability which we've discovered last year. It's been in uh, Intel reference code, so AP, AP uh, error log. So basically it's pretty interesting one because also providing some of the well, func f additional functionality to collecting the data and providing this data uh, in, uh, in the RAM variable. And basically, unfortunately, it's been um, exploitable attack vector. Right. Demo time about SMM BIOS log. All these vulnerabilities, as you can see, it's pretty stable. It's working very uh, reliable, and uh, it's actually very dangerous. It's why it's very, very important to fix them, because it's open a lot of opportunities for the attacker to gain a lot of privileges and persistent on um, very privileged firmware modes. Um, another one, overclock SMI handler story. And this one, it's interesting because it actually have a clear supply chain problem. This overclock SMI handler, it connects with a module, which is actually kind of like a legacy functionality for overclocking uh, on the game CPUs, but this, uh, on the gamer machines. And basically this functionality um, is actually been removed for a long time, I think a few years ago from many of the platforms. But unfortunately, it's been appears on Intel NAC again. And we noticed that on one of our client platform, and like, why? It's actually freshly updated BIOS. It's new platform. Why is this functionality is available here and actually provides the vulnerable vulnerabilities? Someone just forget to change build script and actually older module unpatched uh, get to the newer firmware. And it clearly say, shows the supply chain problem. Sometimes it can happen. And it also reminds me American Megatrans USB RT issue when the vulnerability is actually some of them been patched or the module been, uh, module been outdated, but it's been constantly given new and new attack vectors. As example, we presented uh, two new vulnerabilities at Offensive Con, which has been found on USB RT with a pretty new uh, hardware, includes the servers. So, also, actually, uh, interesting reminder, when we have such vulnerability like overclocking, uh, it is uh, good to see how we can actually create the list of deprecated modules, which will be never available anymore in the runtime, and the industry can actually just uh, clean up this supply chain Majorly. I think that will be a good idea to have one if someone can actually from the device vendor's perspective to influence on that. All right, let's uh, look on another one. It uh, actually goes through uh, SMM get variable OC setup. And uh, as we can see here, we have a signature to DBS uh, on the top, right? So basically, this bug uh, for make it exploitable, we need to keep the signature to actually bypass all the security checks. And then, basically, we have a controllable pointer in RBX, and uh, we go to actually exploit it over the PCD value. Yep. So let's do the demo. And basically, this vulnerability is actually uh, changing the MI CSP global in VSPTR variable. So basically, through the vulnerability in SMM, and this is pretty cool one because it also can bypass authenticated variables. Um, 
one of the previous vulnerabilities which we've been talking about triggering this vulnerability over uh, S3 sleep mode, um, it's been a constant discussion because um, some, of, some of the vendors been saying like this vulnerability is only exploitable on the client systems because the sleep mode is not available on the server machines. But unfortunately, it's not true because sleep mode can be, uh, it's completely in, implemented in software on the operating systems. You can use on Linux, RTCP Wake, and some other functionality to actually uh, uh, do that on Windows. And uh, servers are impacted, but it actually needs some additional effort from the attacker to call such functions to go to the sleep mode. So, yeah, it's exactly what I told you. So basically, Linux and Windows, uh, just to configure in S3 functionality, we can make it, this exploitation uh, successful on uh, servers. And um, basically, saying this, it's not exploitable for servers, it's actually delays the disclosure for almost a month for the server machines from one of the vendors. And I think basically collaborating, better collaboration between the vendor and researcher and go in more transparent way about like, yes, it is impactful, it actually will be, first of all, protect better than ecosystem. Another vulnerability we're talking about uh, uh, binarily 20, 22nd, uh, 15. So basically this one is actually arbitrary code execution in DXC. And what interesting, so basically this driver, it's not privileged, it's not SMM system management mod driver. And of course, like, um, it's given attacker opportunity to bypass Nanogerly uh, the secure boot, but basically also it's open another attack surface. What if, if we exploit in the vulnerability not directly from operating system, what if we gain the code execution on Dixie phase and then exploit something from there? And actually most of uh, most, of, uh, most of the security features being designed and not considering this as an attack surface. And as example, Intel BiosGuard, I don't know guys if you, everyone knows what the BiosGuard is, but it's actually protecting the SpyFlare storage from the changes. So basically, it's very important security feature uh, against uh, firmware implants. But it can be easily disabled by one data buffer. So also a reminder, all vulnerabilities we presented, it is actually will be not protecting from secure cores, it will be not protected with DRTMs, SRTMs, and other stuff because TPMs are not extending their PCR in runtime where all this measurement is stored, right? And remote health of the station for the devices will be completely blind for such exploitation. But let's talk about the automation. And this is very important piece, why it is repeatable failures, because it's a lot of vulnerabilities exist in the space, and I think it's need to be fixed. Of course, like we already committed to ecosystem and presented the EFI Explorer uh, plugin a few years ago on Black Hat uh, Europe, and also we developed the whole approach with white wet static analysis and under constraint symbolic execution to find such problems. So just an example, if we um, go with static analysis without some partial emulation or actual symbolic execution for discovery, it actually can cause some of the false positives in some cases. And uh, if I explore actually contain automatic discovery for vulnerabilities with the Git variables, just use it on your firmware for uh, finding it before releasing to the customers. But how we can actually can uh, improve it and what the limitations are about the current approaches. It is, first of all, um, uh, numbers of false positives. It's basically uh, most of them based on very straightforward pattern matching, and um, which has created a lot of limitations. And our approach is actually leverage semantic, semantic properties and lightweight content code patterns for actually develop the checkers to detect it. So it's just like a, literally a pipeline for the analysis, don't want to spend much time. Uh, interesting point, it is intermediate representation which is actually used for symbolic execution and semantic annotations there. So it's how the lifting uh, for uh, customers, as a form, it looks like. 
And uh, here is a sneak peek about uh, semantic annotations. Actually, it's exactly what the firmware hunt does for detections. It's open source uh, technology. Uh, just look on our GitHub. But it goes uh, on top of uh, some intermediate representation to actually power this uh, with the semantic annotations. And uh, static checkers, it's actually pretty straightforward. We just actually add in some additional rule in runtime for kind of like detecting such problems. And uh, it's augmented with uh, code flow and code flow properties and data flow dependencies and properties as well. And we have uh, intercall uh, properties there. So basically, we are instrumenting this intermediate representation to simulate execution from there, right? So, and I think actually about the symbolic execution for finding the SMI vulnerabilities, it's been covered also in my talk in 2016. Actually, at, when I've been working for Intel Corporation, we developed on CIMEX uh, the whole framework for finding such vulnerabilities. But looks like it's been not used much after I left. All right, another pay phase vulnerability, it's 2014, uh, 20, 20 uh, uh, get variable leading to arbitrary code execution. And um, this one is very important to remember because this one we used for actual Intel PPM bypass. And um, also, it's been found, as you can see here, it's actually been found uh, uh, over our uh, framework, right, with a symbolic execution. Another demo, it's uh, uh, get variable, another one, but in system management mode. So basically, uh, it's detect, uh, detected. Yep. And buffer overflow, classical, with a comb buffer, uh, constraint, so lead to the copy mem. So symbolic execution is pretty effective as you can see here. Anyway, so uh, first of all, I uh, wanted to thank you the PCRT from American Megatrends to actually uh, doing the hard job to patch all the vulnerabilities we discovered and actually uh, related to American Megatrends and uh, uh, help uh, protect the ecosystem. So uh, another coup is these goals to the HPP cert, which has been constantly working with the binary team on the different disclosures. And uh, it's been a hard work from the team to actually uh, make all these products are secure and all the advisories are public now. All right, but let's focus on Intel PPAM and STM internals. So um, STM and PPAM, it's actually the most fancy mitigations on system management mode it's get applied for most recent times, right? So basically what's happening uh, on PPAM, it's provide isolation for every SMI handler from each other. Previously, when you exploit one SMI handler, you get access to the flat memory space and you can actually uh, influence on any others. After the PPAM get introduced, it's actually pretty close what uh, on ARM trusted execution environment uh, uh, does. It's isolating different TZ apps. It's the same thing with SMI handlers should happen, right? How the PPM work? It actually can break on three different phases. First phase is, of course, like kind of like a understand if PPM will be enabled and the right uh, platform properties are available. Second, it's kind of like initializing the monitor and then get modules loaded and policies. So it's uh, how actually uh, the policies are get checked and uh, loaded. In, uh, policies are here uh, about um, this one is actually important. You can see here it's checking the PPAM image before loading to parse all the policies. And all these features are un undocumented. It's actually been reverse engineered by binary team and provide all this information available to research community. So basically what's happening, check PPAM image it's actually just about like MSEC SMRAM uh, hope will be break PPAM initialization, right? So if we have able to single byte write to the memory space with MSEC SMRAM, 
we can change some data storage, which is actually will be break initialization and the feature will be disabled. I remember the slide at the beginning with the boot guard. That's exactly the same type of vulnerabilities can be used for bypassing such security features. And uh, PPM manifest uh, saved in the configuration table. And uh, basically it can be received by operating system component in runtime easily. So another one, installation and configuration for the policies on access basically Every SMI handler have a configuration for initialization of access to input-output ports, MSR registers, and some other policies. Uh, actually, it's pretty interesting technology, and I think actually it is a game changer in general, but it's need to be more uh, securely designed because on the specifications looks better than actual implementations. Let's talk about the attack surface. And we use as a target one of the most recent HP platforms. And basically, uh, this uh, Elite Book, I think it's based on the Tiger Lake CPU, which is very new, it's 11th generation. And uh, it's how actually this picture summarizes a whole block of the information we've been talking before uh, and how this connects to the PPM bypass. So, we have uh, pre e 5 vulnerabilities, which is can influence to some data storage, which is here actually showed as a hopes data, and then uh, bypass the who configuration uh, loading for the people. Boom. We have a CPU SMM uh, variable, which is actually contains some configurational data. And as we can see, Intel reference implementation, which is available on GitHub, like a POC, so it is um, kind of like it looks different. So, and uh, also, this hop data, it's accessible from the operating system layer, but basically we can go through the PI to kind of like a bypass this. So I will be move a bit faster just to able to cover very important information on the next slide. So, PPM manifest. It's actually all the data about the policies contained there. And of course, it should be signed and attestation should work for this manifest. Unfortunately, what we discover, all the certificates across multiple vendors and platforms, they've been outdated. And it's just a bit more details uh, on the certificate. Actually, we reverse engineer this, and all the parses will be available a bit later. It's under embargo now. Um, and PIPA manifest actually outdated not on a single platform, as I mentioned. We checked a lot of different platforms. Probably like 2020, it's been one of the first PPM configurations and uh, uh, implementations, and basically it's why it's not been much available in the wild. But we check it around like 200 systems, uh, and all of them actually outdated with the previous year certificate. What that mean? Attestation for uh, this feature, it just doesn't work or never been used. So uh, I think this certificate, it's been um, kind of embedded uh, to the reference implementation from silicon vendor and then shipped to the device manufacturers and they just use this reference implementation in place and never get updated this root certificate for, um, for uh, uh, attestation. And uh, uh, think is, uh, this certificate is actually issued by Intel Corporation and uh, I think it also shows a very important supply chain problem which is not, don't need any fancy exploitation. So basically uh, this kind of like a problem with certificate validity valid after, right? All the verification will be failed but the code are signed. If we will be embed such thing or component to newer firmware, basically it will be failed to load, right? And also the PPM features, right now it's available only the most uh, expensive uh, Intel CPUs with vPro. So basically that's interesting way which is goes to bypass the PPM from the different perspective without exploitation. We show you some with an exploitation and here is without, without supply chain failure from the vendor. 
but also thank you for Intel PCR. We've been a few months very hard working with them closely to actually make all the fixes available. And um, as a conclusion, I think it's important to remember, so these features should be properly configured by the vendors and consistent with an ecosystem. Again, stat static storage, it's actually contain a lot of important data, which it should be considered as a potential attack surface and actually open the attacker for uh, possibilities for the easy bypasses. And um, also, it could be modified something in memory and lead arbitrary code execution gaining during the early boot, right? And this actually allows the attacker to gain much more interesting security boundaries and attack the platforms. And just one more reminder to the industry, complexity, it is an enemy of security. So all um, actually firmware hunt rules uh, for detection such vulnerabilities at scale, the scanner, everything is open sourced, available on the GitHub, and all the advisories are public, so please enjoy uh, looking on it and fixing these problems at scale. Thank you very much.